Hey, it's Guilherme, and in this video we are going to explore the new Open Simplex Noise class from Godot 3.1. So if you want to run this demo or you'd like to follow along, you are going to need an alpha version of Godot because this class is not available on version 3.0. And in the end, we are also going to look at a map that is being procedurally generated using this class. Before understanding what is the Open Simplex Noise class, we have to first know what noise is. By looking at this picture, you can see what noise is. The values that you see don't have any relevance to the others around them. So they are just randomly generated. And that's mainly what you get when you use something like rand range in Godot. The values don't take into consideration their neighbors when being generated. They are just random. And when you put them in an image, that's pretty much what you're going to see. Something that reassembles the OTVs when we were out of signal. But when we are talking about open simplex noise, the values that are being generated take into consideration the values that are around them. This gives us something like this. Just by looking at this picture, you can already see that the values do have something in common to the ones that are around them. We don't have any abrupt change of colors, so we don't have anything that is black right beside something that is white. You get this nice fade or this gradient when moving from color to color. And by using this, we are dealing with values that are not completely random. They can be called pseudo-random values, and thus, because of the way that they are being generated, the results that we get are way more natural. Another thing to keep in mind is if you start to research about it, you're probably going to hear a lot of purling noise. And purling noise is just the father of simplex noise. Simplex noise was created in 2001, and it is a revision of the purling noise, which gives us more performance. Now, purling noise, or simplex noise, whatever you want to call it, can be used to create an array of things. Not only maps, as we are going to see here, but they can also be used to create textures. Here we can see an example of a texture for a cloud, but you can use it to generate textures for anything that you want. Shaders, and of course, map generation for games. Probably one of the most known games that most likely uses purling noise is Minecraft. Although I'm pretty sure that for the caves they use something called purling worms. Terraria is another great example that probably uses purling noise to generate its maps. And the list goes on and on. Keep in mind that even though these games probably use purling noise, that might not be the only algorithm that they are using to generate their maps. They might be using something else on top of purling noise or simplex noise to create these beautiful worlds. Now, without further ado, let's jump into Godot and see this in action. We are going to create a new 2D scene and the layout is a little bit different because again, I'm using Godot Alpha and this is the new default layout. So let's create a 2D scene. I'm going to rename the node to demo and we're going to add a new sprite as a child of this node 2D. With the sprite selected, we are going to go to the inspector and create a new noise texture to it. You can already see that we have this black rectangle. And now if we click in this section, we are able to edit it. I'm going to set the width to 1280 by 720. And you can see that we have this property called noise. And here we need to create a new open simplex noise. So we're going to create it. And now you can already see something that we saw in the examples before. And I'm going to zoom out and center the sprite using the grid and the snap. In this scene, we're going to be able to visualize how we can change the configuration of our open simplex noise to generate different kinds of textures with it, which is also going to help us when we start to create our map. And to edit these configurations, we have to click on the noise here in the inspector and it's going to open its configurations. The open simplex class abstracts to us the generation of the numbers and exposes some control variables that we can use to, again, play around and determine how we want our noise to be generated. Purling noise can be used to generate noise in several dimensions, ranging from one to n dimensions, so as many as you want. The implementation that we have in Godot goes from one to four dimensions, but here we're only going to take a look at 2D noise. The seed, as you may already have guessed, is a number that is going to be used as a seed to the generation of the other numbers. So by changing this, we get a different result with the same configuration. Games also tend to use this value to let players share cool worlds that they found 
with their friends. Now the octaves, you can think of them as a layer. Each new octave adds us a new layer of pearly noise or simplex noise on top of the layer that's under it. So if we change the octaves to one, you can see that we get this really blurry and kind of boring noise because we only have one layer of pearly noise and the numbers just go from pure black to pure white and again and again and again. And by increasing the number of octaves, we are adding more detail to our image. An analogy that can be used to better understand what is octaves and what they are used for is think that we are generating a map here and the first octave is giving us the shape of the mountains. The second octave gives us the boulders that are on our mountains and the third octaves is giving us our pebbles and so on and so forth. The period can again, just like the octaves, be better understood by using an analogy and you can think of it as how zoomed in we are on our noise. By increasing the value, we are zooming in into our image and by decreasing this value, we are zooming out. The persistence defines how much each octave will influence in the overall noise generated and the lower this value, less influence we will get from the layers of octaves that we are having in our noise. You can see the result of changing this by decreasing the value and increasing it. If we set our persistence to something like zero, you'll see that we have the same thing that we had before when we only had one octave. And that is because that now they don't have any influence on the noise that's being generated. So I'm going to change this back to 0 0.5 and the octaves to 3. And now we are back to the same result that we had before. Finally, the lacunarity defines how quickly the frequency of each consecutive octave will increase. But you can abstract it and just think as it has something to do with the frequency on the values of our octaves. And I know that this might be a lot to remember at first, but with time and while playing with these values, you are going to better understand what they are used for. And in sum, each octave is going to change values with more frequency, and this is controlled by our lacunarity and they can influence more or less on the final noise, which is then controlled by our persistence. And finally, we have the period which allows us to zoom in and out from the noise. I strongly suggest that you play around with these values and see how they affect the noise that's being generated so you can better understand for yourself what they're used for. This is the best way to understand. But hopefully this explanation gave you a solid base that you can grow from. Now we're going to look at our game scene where we are procedurally generating a map using the Open Simplex Noise class. The scene has a tile map that has three auto tiles, one for the grass, one for the rocks, and lastly one for the sand. Each one of these tiles has an index that's going to be used in our script to place these tiles based on the noise that we are getting from our Open Simplex Noise. And we also have a player that is used to just walk around our map so we can see the results. I'll open the game script. At first, we just define how big we want our map to be by using the width and a height. We then have a dictionary that we use to know what are the indexes of our tiles. And lastly, we have a variable that is going to store a reference to our open simplex noise. On the ready function, we start by calling randomize because we are going to use random numbers here. So we do have to call randomize. We then create a new instance of the open simplex noise by calling new on the class and we pass to it a seed by using a random integer. We then configure our open simplex noise the same way that we were doing before, but this time using code. So we define the number of octaves, the period, the lacunarity, and also the persistence. And we then call the generate world function that is going to generate our world. The generate world function uses two fours, one for the width and another one for the height. And each time we iterate on the values, we're going to set a cell on a given position in our map. And when defining this position, we decrease half the width from the X and half the height from the Y. This way, our player is going to appear right in the middle of the generated map. And when calling set cell V, we also need to pass to it an index, which is going to represent what tile we are going to set in that given cell. And to do that, we call a function called get tile index that's going to return to us the index of a tile based on the sample that we get from our open simplex noise. And to get this noise sample, we're calling get noise 2D in our open simplex noise instance. 
and passing to it two values, which is the X and the Y. The values expected in this function are floats. So that's why we are converting them from integers to floats. The noise generated in the get noise 2 d ranges from minus one to one. Based on these values, we can determine which type of tile we are going to place in that given position. And after generating the map, we update our bit mask region. This way our auto tile gets updated and our map is going to look fine just as we expected. In the get tile index, we receive our noise sample. If it is lesser than minus 0.1, we're going to return a sand. But if it's greater than minus 0.1, but lesser than 0.4, we're going to return a rock. And if it all failed, we're going to return a grass. If I run this game, you notice that it takes a while for it to boot up. And that is because it's generating the map. And when it's done, we're now able to move around of our map using our player. And you can see that the map that we get is completely procedurally generated. You can see some artifacts, for instance, here, we only have this rock. We could also have different passes of our map generating algorithm to clean this up. But as this is just an example, we won't have to worry about them. And we can also close the game and run it again to see a different result. And there we go, a completely different map. This approach is not limited to top-down maps. You can use it to create platformers or even 3D maps. So it's only up to your imagination to figure out how you can use them to create all kinds of different maps for your games. And you could also add more details by checking different ranges. Let's pretend that we had different types of sand tiles that had details on them, for instance, some rocks or some types of artifacts. And we could check here, okay, so if we are in a value that is lesser than minus 0.1, we are going to check if it is lesser than, for instance, minus 0.2, and we are going to add this type of sand tile. But if it's greater than something, we're going to add this different type of sand. And this can also be done for the rock and the grass. You can add, of course, more types of tiles for your game, add enemies, dungeons, and so on and so forth. And if you want to play around with this demo, as always, the link for the GitHub repository is in the description. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.